Welcome to Transformation Church. Today is Resurrection Sunday. We're going to raise up the name of Jesus, for he is our risen Savior. He is our risen King. Thank you, Lord, for turning graves into gardens today. Let's sing this song together. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and you put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love.
welcome to Transformation Church and Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Come on, He is risen. We are celebrating a God who is not dead, but He is alive. And I love the song we just sang, Graves into Gardens. This is a picture of the God that we serve. This is a picture of His nature. This is honestly a picture of my life, and it's a picture of your life. You know, throughout life, it only takes a second to realize that there are areas that we feel out of our control. There are areas that feel like they're dead. I know for me, there's been times where it felt like mentally and emotionally, I felt dead. There were times maybe where your relationships felt dead, where maybe there's a business that feels dead. There's a relationship between a father and a son, between a mother and a daughter, between grandparents and their children. Wherever it is, it feels like it's dead. But I came to tell you there is good news. Today Today, we are celebrating Sunday and not Friday. You see, Friday was the day where everybody focused on what they thought was dead. Friday was the day where the disciples were confused, where they didn't understand, and Saturday, the day the earth stood still. But Sunday is the day where we celebrate that God is alive. And I want to encourage you, no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter how hard it feels right now, I wanna encourage you that there is a God who not only loves you, but he loves you so much that he stepped down into human history and he put on skin and bone and he lived a sinless and perfect life. And when he went into that grave, it was because of me and you. Hebrews says it this way, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. I'm telling you, you can be encouraged today. You can be excited today because of regardless of what feels like it's in a grave. God is alive and I'm telling you that means that no matter where you're at whatever feels dead God can bring it back to life listen I am excited because it's Easter Sunday y'all and we want to officially welcome you to Transformation Church and uh, hey listen we're so glad that you're here so honored that you would take time with your family uh, to be here with us on Sunday. And uh, on behalf of our lead pastors, pastors Michael and Natalie Todd, I wanna welcome you to church today. And you need to know this, our church has a clear mission and a clear vision. It's to represent God to the lost and the found for transformation in Christ. That's why we do everything that we do. That's why we're sitting here in a garden. That's why we do all of this. It's not for uh, to impress people. It's so people would actually see God in a new way. And we say it's to the lost and the found. No matter what you did last night, no matter if you grew up in church and you read your Bible every single day, or you were just smoking weed last night and you were out partying or you were out, whatever, no matter where you are, you may feel hurt on the inside, broken on the inside. Let me tell you this, but you don't have to believe what we believe. You don't have to behave a certain way. You belong here. Why? Because Jesus did not come to save those who were perfect. He did not come to rescue those who had their life all put together. He came for those who were broken, just like me and just like you. So you fit right in here at Transformation Church. Listen, we're gonna continue in our service. It's Easter weekend. I know there are so many new guests. And again, we wanna welcome you. And actually, we'd love to connect with you. If you send a text to the number that's on your screen, send the word VIP. We would love to connect with you, to send you some resources, a little bit more about our church and really how we can serve you and your family. We're going to keep going in our service today and we're going to take a moment to worship God through giving. Every single weekend we give uh, really out of response because God has given so much. I mean, this weekend is a beautiful picture that God gave us more than we could ever um, earn or deserve in our life. And this weekend we're celebrating that. And I want to take a moment as we give today just to say thank you genuinely thank you not on behalf of me but on behalf of the thousands of lives that are being changed because of your giving you see many times it's hard for us to connect the dots but you see when you give it allows us to continue to represent to continue to present the gospel and because you give and because we represent there's people's lives who are changed forever something we say here all the time is it's about progression and not perfection and you know, there is a story of a man named Will whose life really exemplifies the beauty of God's grace, of his love, and of his mercy. And uh, I wanna ask you, no matter where you are, if you're with your family, maybe you're watching with a group of friends, maybe you got your Easter hat on right now. You can take the hat off, you got your pictures, and I wanna ask you to sit down and uh, join us in this moment. But we're gonna see how God transformed Will's life. Check out this story. My name is Will, 
And it doesn't make any sense that I'm sitting here being able to share my story. You know, I don't know why I keep recording things. Um, Because the intent of me recording from the beginning was, you know, in hope that things would get better and um, I could watch the progression and and um, and see how good things are. And they're not. They're not good at all. I'm, yeah, I'm running on empty. Um, I got into drugs at a very young age. Um, I was about 13, going on 14, thought I knew everything. And then one thing led to another. Um, I started smoking pot, and then I started introducing alcohol, and then I started introducing all the things, I mean, from cocaine to heroin to meth, over those 10 years of my drug addiction. And back then they would have told me, you know, don't do drugs, don't you know, I know that's such a, common thing to hear and when I was a kid man I just thought that was such a joke and no don't do drugs you know but man, if they would have told me that I would just want to die every day from doing drugs I would have never done them I remember pulling up to my house uh, one night and uh, there was a lot of cop cars and I remember they, they had they had the warrants, they, they had all the documents they needed and they took me in and searched my house and it was all this stuff. And I remember fast forward nine months of court proceedings, having an ankle monitor and the, the judge, she put down the gavel and she said a bunch of words, no idea what she said. Uh, all I heard was my dad explaining to my family in the back and I just heard he's going to jail and you can't say goodbye, and um, it was hard. Um, they put me in the basement of a jail in isolation by myself, and I remember being in there, I don't know how many days passed, but they were the most miserable days of my life. It almost felt like the absence of God, um, and I know that, that was, I know he was there with me, I know he was deep down, but I felt like his hand was removed. I felt like I had nothing. Um, there was nobody to talk to, I was trapped in my head. If for some reason something does happen to me and I give in to the the thoughts of, you know, ending it, I just want my family to know that there was nothing. There was nothing you could have done. I'm in a very, very dark place right now. One day in my cell, I literally said, God, I hate my life. You can have it. And I just began to pray. And I I don't even know what I said, but I just remember I felt different. I felt like, okay, I think God's in here with me. And I just began to pray even more and I'm crying and I don't know why I'm crying. And I was repenting for everything that I had ever done. Um, And I just remember at the end of that thing, I said, God, I hate my life. You take it, you have it, you do whatever you want. And it was just this sign, I threw up my hands, complete surrender. In the moment I said, amen, everything changed. Um, My heart felt different. I, I can't explain the, the warmth I felt throughout my arms, my hands, my veins. Um, I just, I felt the presence of God for the very first time. I mean, nothing was the same. I was the happiest, most free I'd ever been in my life. And I was sitting in the basement of a jail. I read the Bible, um, I got out. I didn't know what to do. All God said was serve. Surrender, serve. Stay surrendered, stay serving. And so I ended up just, um, I hit up um, one of my friends. They let me serve with adults with special needs. Started doing that. Ended up doing an internship at a church. Loved that. Got into ministry and God just opened up door after door after door. Thinking and recording when I I flashed back to when I was recording those videos. When I had zero hope. And I had zero hope of having a family. I want to be a husband. I want to have kids. I want to be a good father. You know, obviously I, I need to fix myself first. But man, I am so looking forward to the day that I meet that girl that I will spend my life with. God brought me Kaylee, my beautiful wife, and she's amazing. Um, and again, I said, all right, God, you brought me Kaylee. I'm good. I don't need anything else. 
But again, that's not God. He wants to do exceedingly, abundantly more, and that's exactly what he did. The moment he brought me my son, just a few months ago, Arrow James was born, and the only reason I can sit here today is because Jesus brings freedom. And I surrendered everything, and Jesus has given me everything. And I just continue to see the faithfulness of God every single day of my life. I just cannot wait for the day that I can watch this and know that I did it. I really hope that that happens one day. Come on, that is transformation in Christ. That's someone's life being changed. Listen, uh, you may have watched that story and saw yourself. You may have seen moments where you felt alone, moments where you felt like there wasn't hope, moments where you felt like God maybe didn't see you, but then just in the nick of time, just like he did with Will, God stepped in and he made a way. Listen, when you give to Transformation Church, you're not giving to a building, you're not giving to an organization, you are giving to real people with real stories. You're giving to see lives transformed. And I wanna say thank you. I wanna take a moment right now as we continue in our service, and I wanna ask us to pray. I want us to pray because this uh, can easily become just a routine. It easily becomes just a religious activity. But my prayer is that this would not just be a routine, but this would be a response, a response to God's grace, a response that realizes that without the goodness of God, we are not here. But because of his love, because of his mercy, me and you, we have experienced life and life to the full. I want to take a moment right now around the world. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we love you so much. And the truth is, as much as we love you, uh, it somehow still pales in comparison to how much you love us, how much you care about us, Lord. The love that would send its only son, a love that would say, even though they're not thinking about me, even though some of them will reject me, just in case I'm sending my son. Lord, a love like that is something that changes us from the inside out. Lord, I pray that as we give today, may we give out of response to that love. May we not give trying to achieve something or trying to prove that we're good people or because it's what we're supposed to do. May we give out of a genuine, deep place of gratitude, out of a place that understands without the grace of God, we are not here in this moment, Lord God. An understanding that says, Lord Jesus, I give not to serve me, not to check off my religious box. I give because God has given me so much. And I give because my hope is that God would use it to transform lives. Lord, I take a moment and I pray right now for everybody who's watching for the first time. Maybe you've never found yourself in a space of faith like this. If you're watching, Lord, I just want to pray that these people, they wouldn't see the lights, they wouldn't see even the garden, but may they see actually the gardener, the person, Lord, that this is all about. This is not about transformation, church. This is about the King of Kings. And my prayer for everyone watching is that they would see Jesus in a new way. Lord God, I pray that as we give, you would bless it May you use it to transform lives around the world. It's in the beautiful name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen. Hey, listen, uh, before we continue in service today, I have something that I am so excited to announce. My goodness, listen, we have been planning and praying and preparing and we've been doing it all. My goodness, I can tell you that much. But we have an exciting announcement for you today. And you know what? The team, they said, you can't say it first. We've got a video, so I need you to check out this special announcement. I hear the sound of revival.
right, Transformation Conference version two is on the way. Listen, you need to start making plans right now. Listen, we're gonna be in Tulsa in fall 2022 and it's going to be amazing. It's gonna be a time to be refreshed, to be revived. I'm believing it's a time that is gonna transform all of our lives. Listen, if you're interested in joining us in the fall, we would love for you to be here. You can go to our app, our website and get more information, sign up to get updates as we're getting closer to the day, but we are so excited for all God is going to do as we get to get back together and continue to worship God as a family. Hey, listen, around the world, we're going to continue to worship on this Resurrection Sunday. So I need you in your homes, with your family, stand up and let's worship God around the world.
bows before your name but we will not wait until to display the vast beauty and wonders of nature. One can often find flowers, trees, vegetables, fruit, and wildlife making their home within its borders. Typically, tended by gardeners with copious vision and patience. Gardens are an amalgamation of tested faith and divine timing. But do you really know how important a garden is? The garden God's first gift to humanity. It was in a beautiful place like this that God breathed into dirt and created Adam. This place was declared holy, where he walked and talked with human beings he made in the cool of the day, freely sharing his plans. With this gift came a name, and in that name, God's image made its home, Eden. Full of peace, full of provision, full of life, full of the only thing that had no limit, no barrier, no restraint, God's presence. The beauty of nature's wonderland, however, was not without fault, for therein resides deception, lies, and evil. God gave Adam and Eve one request, not to eat from the tree of knowledge, but sin slithered in and Adam and Eve, although they had everything they needed to be content, through a lie of deception, they broke God's one request. A lie that caused them to break the one boundary God had set for them. They missed the mark. One act of sin, one act of pride, one act of disobedience, and the garden was lost.
sorry God's heart broke when sin entered the world. With time's progression came his children's regression, and his longing for restoration to them compelled him to do the unthinkable. He chose Mary to carry the Son of Man, our Savior, Jesus, Son of God. There in that manger, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords made his grand but humble debut. Though he grew up similarly to his peers, he also knew of the internal greatness he possessed that separated him from everyone else. At age 12, he strayed away from his mother and began telling people the truth about the gospel, setting straight those who had previously mistaken it for something that it wasn't. His mother frantically searched for him. And once she found him, we didn't hear from him again until 18 years later. Jesus' silence in the scripture was filled with everyday tasks, like working with his father Joseph as a carpenter. And then the time for the extraordinary came. During a particular wedding feast, supplies ran low and drinks ran out. Though he didn't feel ready, Jesus listened to the plea from his mother and performed his first miracle, turning water into wine. After some time, Jesus was baptized by his cousin John, marking the beginning of his ministry, one that would soon transform so many lives. Blind eyes were opened, lame legs began walking, deaf ears started hearing. Healing accompanied him everywhere he went. And even after all the great things he did while on earth, he knew he had yet to fulfill his true purpose. He knew his time was coming to an end. Of the 12 men he walked and talked with and poured into daily, he knew one of them would soon betray him. After one final meal with his closest friends, Jesus withdrew to the Garden of Gethsemane, his spirit overwhelmed with grief and agony for the journey ahead of him. Here we are again, back in the garden. It was a beautiful place like this that you breathed into dirt and created the first Adam. This was the place you declared, here is holy, where you walked and talked with the human beings you made in the cool of the day, freely sharing your plans and your provision. This is where it all started. And now this is where it's destined to end Father, I've got to be honest, I'm struggling with this. Are you sure there's no other way? I mean, I know that your ultimate priority is reconciling your creation back to you, even though they're the reason we're here. I wonder if 
if they knew that their sin would have this much consequence. You told them not to eat of the forbidden fruit or they would surely die. I'm sure they considered that I have to die to redeem their sin. People betrayed you back then and have been betraying us ever since. Even the ones who have walked and talked with me, who I poured into 24-7, even they fall asleep on me in my deepest moment of agony. Even they will turn their backs on me. Nevertheless, here is holy. This is the most challenging act of obedience I've ever carried out. But I have the audacity to believe that you are with me here. If there's some other way your purpose can prevail, then please, please, Lord, take this cup from me. If there's someone else you can call on, something else they can do. If not, I understand. And I'm still committed to your plan. I will be your second Adam. I was born for this moment. There's a wall separating the created from the creator who loves them, knows them, and calls them by name. Even the ones who turn their backs on him. And now I have been trusted with the responsibility of tearing down that wall. I know you chose me. I know you love me. I know you're with me, even here. i 
Was Christ really buried? Is this whole story very fairy and that was just a man? Did they really find his bones and then lie to keep the code or did he walk out of the tomb to the throne? Was he God? Was he not? Did he buy us a spot in the heaven or is all this a ruse? Are we just delusional dudes who refuse to believe in the truth? Are we fools? Christ that was foretold, Christ that the Lord knows. Many men claimed him, but did he ever claim them? Put him in the grave, but they couldn't restrain him. Said that he was false, but never could defame him. Yes, he did arrive. Yes, he was alive. Yes, he did arise three days after he died. Christ of the Galilee, Christ of the Nazareth. What can I say? Yes, he is God. The leaves, blood on the trees, came down and died. Same blood is on me. That was the price. Somebody had to pay it. Anybody not covered by the blood will be taken. That was the price, and nobody else could pay it. Transformation Church, I got good news for you. He has risen. Let's give God some praise. Come on, in your house, at the job, on the track. Hallelujah. Today, we are so excited that you decided to join us for church because today is the biggest day of our faith. It's where we celebrate the amazing, sacrificial, loving gift that God gave for all of us in his whole life. And today, no matter how you got here, I want you to know that we prayed for you. That a whole community of people have been praying, inviting, believing that you would be here right now. And I don't care what you did yesterday, and I don't care what you're planning to do tomorrow. Today is a beautiful day for you to experience the good news of Jesus Christ. And I ain't pulling back no punches. I want you to get to know Jesus. I don't care what you heard about him. I'm proof right here that he can transform your entire life. I'm sorry I'm a little passionate right now. But the thing that I know is that if you would ever get to know the real Jesus, not the one that religion introduced you to, not the one that you see in angry preachers or people who believe in the prosperity gospel or people who are trying, like not that, no. I, I want you to meet the real Jesus. And that's why our church and our community has been called to represent God to the lost and the found. That means everybody welcome here. But for one reason, what is it y'all? Transformation in Christ. And I just want you to know that's what we're believing for you today. Today, we are going to experience the greatest story ever told. And I'm going to be real with you. I can't understand how people get up here and be unauthentic. I'm going to share hot, humble, open, and transparent about how God has transformed my life. And hopefully, hopefully through my transparency, and this honesty that I feel in this moment right now, I can't shake this, y'all. Somebody's life is about to get transformed and changed right now. In this moment right now, I'm just asking for a few minutes for you to be able to open up your heart. Somebody just, if you feel comfortable, lift your hands and say, God, I'm ready to receive. Come on, just one more time. I'm ready to receive. I know you had a hard week. I know the kids' hair wasn't right for the Easter pictures. I know all the things are happening right now. But I just want you to say, God, I'm ready to receive. And at this moment, God, I thank you that you would do something in my brother and my sister's life that would change them forever. Speak to all of us. And God, I'm just a, a little vessel who's flawed, but your grace has seen me, changed me, and God, here I am to serve you. Today, God, let something that's said and done give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, somebody say, we agree. We expect. Amen. I want to welcome you to the garden. Glory to God. 
Is anybody ready for the word this morning? All right, all right, all right, all right. Everybody take your seat. If you're at home, I want to let you know that God has been um, really downloading to me a word for every person that would be watching. And again, I am excited for the opportunity to be able to share with you what I consider the greatest story ever told. The story that has changed humanity, the story that has changed history, and the one that I care about most, the one that's changed me. (laughs) Like, I know who I was, and I know a lot of times people get up here and they, on Easter, they try to act like they're something they not. I was busted and disgusted. Let me already start from the top that I was addicted to pornography. I was a liar. I was a manipulator. I was somebody that didn't have his priorities straight. Let me tell the people for real who I am and where I was, because a lot of pastors will get up here and they think because it's in a suit, it ain't sloppy. L- listen, there are areas in my life that before Jesus were so sloppy, and can I be real, real? There are areas that God is still working with me on. Okay, let me come for all the people who are going to be fake. How many people in the room and around the world have an area that God is still working on you in? Thank you. Thank, some of y'all need to have two hands up and feet. Uh, okay, thank you. But as you allow God to come into those sloppy situations, he brings his spirit. And when the spirit of God comes into the situation, it changes everything. And today, I believe in your home, whether you're watching this on rebroadcast, whether you're watching this with your friends or your family, whether you're watching this in the middle of the worst situation of your life, I believe the spirit of God is here to bring you encouragement, life. Somebody shout at me, life. See, that's the reason Jesus came, that we would have life and life to the full. And today, as we go into this message that God has given me, that's what I'm praying for you and your family, life. See, life is the thing that Jesus gave for us to have life. And as I sit here today on Resurrection Sunday, I don't know if you know, but but today the reason we celebrate this is because in every other religion, whoever the deity is that they worship, they died. And when they died, they died. (laughs) But in our, our relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, when Christ died on Friday, I'm about to get hype in the place right now. When he died on Friday, they thought he died too. But on Saturday, he was working for me and you. And on Sunday morning, ah. And on Sunday morning, somebody's about to understand what I'm saying right now. On Sunday morning, when they checked to see if he was still dead, he had risen. Somebody say he is risen. He is risen risen indeed. And so today, when I minister to you, I'm ministering to you from a place of knowing what it's like to be dead and God bringing me back to life. Okay. And I know there's a lot of people that are watching right now that in some area of your life, you feel dead. Relationally, it feels deceased. Financially, it feels decrepit. (laughs) Let's be honest. Like, like, Like there's areas of our life, emotionally, it feels like it's never going to breathe again. But today I have, somebody shouted me, good news. Did you know that's what the word gospel actually means? All it means is good news. It's not a genre of music. (laughs) It's not a clothing brand. What it means is good news. And we have, somebody type in the chat, good news. And today I want to share this good news, but I want to frame it creatively as I am in, everybody say the garden. See, the garden is a special place because the garden is the first gift to humanity. Now, I want you to go back all the way with me to the beginning. And I want you to see out of everything our loving God could have given us, he gave us a garden. And it was the place where God, and I love this, he he reached down into dirt. 
and he actually put his hand on us. Now, I want you to think about that just for one second because everything else God created in the six days of creation, he spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He, he told the ocean where to go, and he told this thing, this animal, what it could do, and he told all of this stuff. But when he created humanity, me and you, he said, this is my most special creation. I need to put my DNA on it. And he reached down in the dirt. He breathed the breath of life. And then he gave us a place. He didn't just make a people. He gave his people a place. And what place did he give them? He gave us the garden. And it was called the Garden of Eden. And this was the place that God wanted to have uninterrupted relationship with us. I want to give you a point because this was God's first gift to us. All people were created to be in a place of God's presence. If you're breathing right now, I need to do a check. Everybody take a deep breath in, let it out. If you just did that, you were created to be in the presence of God. Now, I know that a lot of things have happened to you, and I know you were born into a crazy family. Come on, how many of us were born into a crazy family? Some of y'all sitting next to him right now. But what I'm telling you is, if you're breathing, you are God's creation, and you're his people. And he designed you to be in his presence. Your physiological makeup desires the presence of God. More than alcohol more than weed, more than sex. Oh, y'all want to be real today? More than money. Your body desires the presence of God. And the crazy thing about it is when we don't feel the presence of God and when we don't feel, watch this, worthy of the presence of God or too ashamed, we then pick up counterfeits. And my question to you is how many counterfeits have you been using to try to replace the thing that you really need, which is the presence of God? Every person that is listening to, listening to me right now has something that they tried to put on the throne of their heart that is not God. And the truth of the matter is for me, as I look back over my life and all the things that God has done for me, I have to acknowledge that the beautiful, amazing place that God made for me to be in with Eden is what I desire, but it's not where I always end up. See, Adam and Eve allowed sin to come in to the beautiful place that God built for his people. And in the original garden, the OG garden, this is the OG, okay? That usually stands for original gangster, but today if I say OG, it means original garden, okay? Everybody, or Olive Garden, where we all gonna go eat after church. Amen, pasta, glory. But in the OG or the original garden, God created Eden for us and him to have relationship. But then God gave us choice. And when he gave us choice, we made the wrong one. Now, everybody gives Adam and Eve a very hard time. Yeah. And I know we all for thousands of years get to now um, um, judge their decision. But if we be honest, how many of us have made a bad choice before? Uh-huh. And when we make a bad choice, hers was something very simple, but it went against the idea of God. She took an apple, which represented something that God said, I don't want you to do. And what she did was she put her lips on something that God gave limits to. Okay, I'm about to, I'm about to start walking through this. Now, 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 I need you to understand that God sometimes gives limits and he doesn't want our lips to be on the place that he made limits. He literally tells them, you can eat of every other tree. But I need to give you a limit and there's something in us that desires when God gives us a limit that's exactly where we want to put our lips. Mm. And I'm not just talking about eating something. I'm talking about talking about something. <laughs> I'm talking about the gossip. I'm talking about the things that we recite in the songs, the things that we, okay, let me stop. Nobody wants to be real today. But God is saying, the reason I gave you limits is because I want you to have life. And around Transformation Church right now, we're, we, we've been in a, a time and a season where we've been acknowledging the word of the year or the phrase of the year that God has given us. It's here is holy. Yeah. 
And the subtitle to that is this is the year of intentional limitation. And when I begin to look at this story in the garden, I realized that sin came in because they overstepped the intentional limitation that God set. And my question to you, in the place that God has put you, somebody say here. here. Are there any limits that you're overstepping right now? Are there any relationships that you know you're not supposed to have right now, but you continue to entertain? Are there any companies and businesses you started knowing that God's hand is no longer on that, but it looks good on your Instagram bio? Is there anything or any place that you still go for a feeling? Uh. That God said, I told you, I need to limit you there because I'm trying to give you, somebody shout at me, life. life. Adam and Eve aren't the only ones who reach over limits. I reached over limits. And if you're honest, you reached over limits. And do you know when we go past the boundary that God sets, he has a name for that. It's called sin. Sin is something that people don't want to talk about. Sin is not something that, that is politically correct. But sin is what the Bible defines as missing the mark. Going over the line. And God said, when you go over the line that I set to protect you, then it doesn't just keep you in the place. It separates you from my presence. The whole reason for the garden was to walk and talk with us every day. The, a place where all provision was there. All peace was there. All the things that we needed were God's priority to us. That grind and that hustle and that thing you always feel like you're chasing in the OG garden. It was all there. But it was the limit that we crossed that created a separation between us and God. And even when I think about this in the original garden, sin robbed us of God's greatest gift to us. A place where we didn't have to worry about what was next. <laughs> Adam and Eve never were trying to figure out what the next thing was. They were always focused on here. Uh-oh. They never had to focus on there, what I'm going to eat there, what I'm going to do there, who I'm going to meet there. All they had to do was focus on here. Because they understood that here is holy. It's where God placed me. And the reason why most of us feel this unending anxiousness it's because we're longing for the garden we're longing for his presence the reason why you can go from relationship to relationship the reason why you can go from drink to drink the reason why you can go from career to career the reason why and you're still thirsty is because you're longing for the presence of God. That's the God-sized hole that will never be filled unless you put God in it. And today, if the story ended right here, it would be horrible. Because in a moment of sin, everything changed. And isn't that what can happen in our lives? That literally in a moment, it can go from something that seems like paradise and it can be changed in to pain. Yeah, just like that. Everything, perspective changes. I thought my life was going one way and then it gets darker. See, in the garden, we didn't just lose plants. <laughs> in the garden, we lost peace. See, sin makes you lose peace. But you don't just lose something, you gain something too. So we lost peace and we gained paranoia. See, when you invite sin in, you lose provision and you bring in problems. In the garden, we lost purity and we got perversion. In the garden, we lost patience and we got panic. 
Isn't that what our world looks like right now? In, in, when we let sin in, when we overstepped the limits, when we did not do it God's way, we lost perspective and we got petty. Oh, y'all better not be faking with me today. Some of y'all are petty. Petty Bettys is what I'm going to call you. you. You're focusing on the wrong things. But can I blame you? Because we lost it when we lost his presence. See, when sin came in, we lost partnership and we traded it for pride. When we let sin in, we lost paradise and we got pain. And when we let sin in, we lost his presence. And watch this. We settled for our preferences. This one hit me hard when I wrote it down. Because there's been so many times that God says, hey, it's going to either be your preferences or my presence. Well, God, I really like this person. Yeah. But that thing is, I'm not in that relationship. So it's going to be either your preference, what you want, what you like, what you desire, or it's going to be my presence. And some of us are at that precipice right now in our lives where we're trying to figure out, God, are we going to do what we want to do or what we like to do? Or are we going to have your presence? I've decided that I don't want to go anywhere without his presence. I feel like Moses, if you ain't going to go with me, we're going to stay right here. And some of y'all need to make that decision right now. If God's not with you in that business deal, we're going to stay right here. If God is not with me moving to that new state, I must stay right here. My preferences don't matter more than his presence. And when we don't understand that, we move in our preferences. Write this down in a point. Your preference is never better than God's presence. Oh, this checks me so hard. Because <laughs> there's things. Okay. Has anybody wanted to do something that you knew God didn't want you to do? But you just really wanted to do it. Come on, hands in the air. Okay, like, I, I, I've, I've come to the point to understand that God's presence, being with me at the job, in the gym, at the school, when I'm talking to my wife, when I'm raising my kids, his presence is more valuable than my pre preference. And most people have lived in this selfish bubble thinking that what I'm, I'm y'all ever heard somebody say I'm just doing me yeah, yeah. this is my truth saying this is my truth don't mean it's the truth yeah. the bible says that the ways of Jesus it's the way the truth and the life and I just came to tell you what I wish somebody would have told me when I was 17 18 19 21 25 27 <laughs> Because don't act like it's because you get an age and you graduate. Oh, come on. I'm 56. Don't nobody tell me what to do. You've still been living off your preferences. Uh-oh, let me stop. And God says what you need, the reason why you can't sleep, the reason why you got to keep grinding and hustling, is because you have lost my, everybody say presence. And I know it's Easter and everybody looking good, but, but let me help you. Your wardrobe is not more important than worship. Yeah, yeah. Your Instagram is not more important than integrity. That's what you get in his presence. Your career is not more important than the character that God is trying to develop in you in his presence. Your success is not imp more important than his spirit. And the number of commas in your account is not more important than your calling. Your plan, this one going to hurt, is not more important than his purpose. You got a plan. He has a purpose. I got a plan for my family. God has a purpose for my family. That's why we have to sell out to God's purpose. And that's why I'm up here today. Because at the end of the day, what happened in the garden is we, our sin, messed up God's plan. But it would not stop his purpose. Ah. See, at the darkest moment, this is when Jesus comes into the story. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. This is the purpose. And God said, now I have a plan. 
Adam and Eve, we was only supposed to do this one take. This was supposed to be a one take situation. You were supposed to be fruitful and multiply. You were supposed to go. And now the director got to step back in and write an alternate ending. He came into the garden and he said, cut, cut. They can no longer be in this place. So I got to remove them from this place. I got to take all the beauty that I created them for. I got to take all the things that I wanted them to have. I got to take the ease. Do y'all know women weren't supposed to even labor in childbirth? All my ladies is like, dang, what happened? We did. You said it's Eve, but it's actually you. Because <laughs> Eve is in you. <laughs> Because the thing that God told you to stay away from, come on, let's be honest. It's the very thing that we allow somebody to slide in the DMs and tell us that night. Uh-oh. God is saying that I created all of this for you. But you decided to choose your preference. So now what I have to do is remove you from the place that I created but I still want relationship with you. When people talk about a loving God, this is the ultimate example of love on display. You disobeyed what I said, and there's supposed to be a consequence, and I'm a holy God and a good God, so I have to give you the consequence. But I'm gonna make a way for you to ex still experience the blessing that I created for you. So God sends, everybody shout his name, Jesus. Jesus. I said, shout his name, Jesus. Jesus. Second Corinthians 5, 19. For God, this is his plan, was in Christ reconciling the entire world to himself. Not reconciling Christians. Not reconciling people who do all the right things. This scripture says he was reconciling who? The world to himself. Watch this, no longer counting people's skin. I mean sin against them. Oh, you know, with all of the climate that's going on in our society right now, everything that's going on, God said, I see your skin and I see your sin. <laughs> and I'm no longer counting that against you. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. And I got good news in the garden today. Somebody say, I got good news in the garden. When God removed us from this garden, then in another garden, somebody say another garden, another garden, he redeemed us. And most believers don't know about the other garden. They only know that we got kicked out of the presence of God. But there was another garden that in that garden, it changed the scenery of our life. See, just like that, it can go from being dark and gloomy and hurtful and hindering our sight to turning into something that changes our view. I think I wanna take this to another level. One, two, three. That's how your life is about to change. No, somebody gotta hear me. That's how your life is about to change as you accept the plan of God and his name is Jesus, I'm feeling happy right now. See, when you allow Jesus to come into your dark situation, when you allow Jesus to transform your life, when you allow Jesus to see your brokenness, he can take what's dark and he can turn it around just like that. But Jesus transformed my life in a different garden. And it's the garden of Gethsemane. See, see, see we lost something in Eden but we gained everything in the garden of Gethsemane. Ooh, I love the word of God. I get excited. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Now, I can't read into this scripture anymore until you understand what the word Gethsemane actually means. Gethsemane means oil press or the place of pressure. 
Why in the world will God allow the son of God to go into a place of pressure? Why in the world would Jesus out of everybody? I mean, literally, if I was God, I'm like, he's going to come to the earth. He's going to mosey up to the cross and he's going to say, you know what? You ain't even got to nail me. Let me just go ahead and lay down. I would have I would have gave a very easy pass. But for some reason, he made him endure a place of pressure. Now, I don't know about you, but 2022 has been a good year, but it's also been a place. <laughs> uh oh. Of pressure. It's been a Gethsemane. It's been a garden that has pressed on me, pressed on my comfort. Am I the only one? Are y'all gonna leave me out here like this? Has anybody had pressure coming? Relational pressure, financial pressure, emotional pressure. Things that you never thought you would have to deal with, but you had an outburst in a situation and you would say where that came from. And the pressure you've been pressing down since you were seven. Uh, it's now at a point where it's in an eruption. A place of pressure. And I begin to think about this in my own life. If God allowed Jesus to go to a place of pressure, how could I think? that I was exempt from being subject to the Garden of Gethsemane. I came to give you good news today, but the good news usually starts off in a hard place. The best place of your life usually never starts out as the best place of your life. The best place of your life usually is wrapped in pain. It's usually wrapped in persecution. It's usually wrapped in a place of pressure. And this man literally goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. Write this down in a point. The place of pressure always produces. See, this is your encouragement today is that if you feel that everything's coming in on you on every side and I don't got what I used to have and the money's acting a little funny and the people who used to be my crew, they acting a little different right now. And I just, this used to fill me up and this used to make me happy and this used to do it for me, but I feel pressed on every side. I promise you, you're in a process right now that is about to produce something in you for your purpose. See, see, see that garden of Gethsemane, there's there's something in there. It was a it was a garden of olives. And now most of y'all only use olives in them strong drinks that you be drinking. <laughs> Ain't nobody just popping olives. But 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 I had the team get me some olives. And the reason why they brought olives is because when an olive was in a place of pressure, they, they weren't just trying to get the olives. What they were trying to get was what was in. And there's so many of us that don't want to go to the place of pressure. But if you would stay, everybody say here. If you would stay at that job, if you would stay in that place, if you would keep serving at the school, what God's trying to do is get the oil out of you. It's the oil that's valuable. <laughs> it's not just the olive, it's what's in it. Uh-oh. It's not just who you are and what your last name is. It's the oil inside of you. The reason why it's been so hard and why God hasn't snatched you out of that place is because the most valuable part of you is the pressed version. Nobody will want to hear from Mike Todd if I didn't let God press me. Uh-oh. Nobody would be encouraged by my failures if I didn't stay in a place where God pressed me. And this is where you think God is mad at you and that he doesn't love you and that somehow he forgot about you. But maybe the place of pressure is the sign that you have purpose. The reason the past five years have looked like this it's because what's coming out of you 
is the thing that is about to change the world. <laughs> the thing that's coming out of you right now. And you're saying, God, I'm so dismembered. I don't even remember how to have fun. I don't even remember who I am. And he said, that's right. You're not supposed to remember that. You're supposed to produce this. Oh, I feel the presence of God right now. Do not leave the place of pressure. I don't know who I'm talking to, but prophetically, somebody is about to make a move. Somebody's about to get in a relationship or get out of a relationship that you were supposed to stay in. And God's saying, don't leave here until I produce what I was created. What I created this garden to produce. It's the opposite of Eden. See, when we were with God, the oil was just on us. But when we sinned, we, we, we got it buried deep inside of us. And so what God says is, I got to let you go through it. Or you'll never get to see the real version of who you are. The place of pressure. Somebody says, always, always. produces. If you allow it to. Oh. Do you know how many people ran from their marriage? How many people dropped out of school because they got one bad grade? Come on, let's be honest. Like, how many people have disowned their family because they don't want to actually confront the real issues? You left the place of pressure. You stopped therapy because they actually touched the issue. Uh-oh. God really revealed something and you say, I ain't going and I sure ain't paying no $160 an hour to do that. I'll talk to myself. Self, huh? <laughs> like you. And God said, I created that place because if you would have stayed, everybody say here. Yeah. Jesus has to decide to stay in the place of pressure. Now I think about this garden of Gethsemane and when we read through this, I see three things that if you are in a garden of Gethsemane or a place of pressure that you need to do as our, our Lord and Savior did to stay in that place. I, I want you to, to get this, write these down. Three things you need in a place of pressure. In the garden of Gethsemane, the first thing you need to do is select your partners. Some of y'all have the weakest team around you. Some of your we is weak. We coming. No, just leave all of them because at the end of the day, they do not have enough strength or excuse me, enough spirit for the place of pressure. Jesus intentionally selects partners. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. It says, then when then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, a place of pressure. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And then taking with him, here's the selection process, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. Okay, get the picture. Right before this, all of them were in the upper room and God was doing amazing work and everybody, it would be the equivalent of us being at a conference and God just moving and, and there go Tasha Cobbs and elevation worship and oh, he's here fire of God fire of God all of this stuff is happening and then Jesus says hey y'all we got to all dip to go to a place of pressure the first thing is if you announce that you're going to a place of pressure <laughs> you automatically gonna go ahead and cut half them people off but Jesus had some disciples that was ready to roll with him so it, it goes from the crowd to his community and when he gets to the place of his community, he says, y'all stay here. Now, it's crazy when you have to tell people who are there to help you. Y'all not ready for this next level, though. I'm just trying to get y'all. This is Jesus, our example. He says, the crowd is great. But I need my community. So community, come with me this far. But now they got to the Garden of Gethsemane. The community was with them, their church family, the people who prayed for them, their moms and dads, they were right there. But then Jesus said, Peter, James, where John at? Tell John to come here. 
this is why God put us together. Because I need y'all. I'm selecting you. Because I'm about to go into a place of pressure. And I got to have the right people around me while I'm walking into this. You three, come with me. And literally the Bible tells us as he selects them, this is something we have to do. We have to know when to look for the crowd, know when to lean on the community, and know when to activate our core. There is a core group of people that you will need in the garden of pressure that will help you be able to make it through. And how do you know that they're the right people? Jesus tells us, and we'll, we'll, we'll reverse engineer it. In Matthew 26, 38, he said, then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. What did Jesus do with his core? He got vulnerable. The only way you know they're your core is that you can actually be completely vulnerable with those people. Let's get it in a point. There's value in being vulnerable. There is value. Somebody say that. There's value in being vulnerable. And I know in a society where everybody's telling you to protect yourself and do your thing and don't share too much. God says that for the pressure you're about to go through, there are a group of people that I've assigned to your life that you're going to have to select. God didn't select them. Jesus did. Uh Uh-oh. That means the people you've been friends with and you got all your birthday pictures with and they've been there. They may not be the ones you select to go into the second garden with. And God is saying, but if you're going to go to this garden, you got to be vulnerable. You got to really say what it is. Imagine a man who is God in human form saying that I am so sorrowful. I want to die. And this is beautiful picture to me because God is being hot, humble, open, and transparent in the form of Jesus, which allows us to know that no matter how we're feeling, even when we feel like we're about to die, it's okay to say it to the right people. So many people act like you don't have faith if you tell the truth. (laughs) How you doing today? Blessed and highly failing? No, today sucks. I'm hurting. I don't want to do this. But we have been so conditioned to live in the veneer that we won't become vulnerable and we don't see the value. But Jesus says, my soul is very sorrowful. Soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. Can we be honest? After COVID, it's kicked some of our aspirations. (laughs) Do whatever you need to do to fill it in. But it's kicked some people's aspirations. For the things that you thought you were going to do. And what the result has been is our souls being sorrowful. I I can't think about that. Have y'all ever said that to yourself? Like, I I, I, don't even even bring it up. I can't even. Your mind is weary. (laughs) Your will. The reason why you pick wrong is because your will is weak. It's your mind, your will. It's been so beat up because you haven't had community or a core to be vulnerable with and to pray with you and to watch with you. That's what he said. He said, watch with me. You may not be going through it, but I need you with me. And their wills have been weak. And their emotions, my emotions. Can I be honest? This year, there's been so many things that have happened to me that have come to sucker punch my emotions. And this is crazy for me because if you know anything about your pastor, um, I'm an eight on the Enneagram. That that means like emotions seem kind of irrelevant (laughs) and actually unnecessary. And and, and up into this place in my life, until I got to this garden, this place of pressure, I would always bottle my emotions. I would always say, why is it important to let you know how I'm feeling all this? And God said for you to be healthy here, You're going to have to deal with how you feel here. 
And Jesus does this. And that's why he says, get vulnerable around a core group of people that you select. Why? Because that's where your healing is going to come from. Look at James chapter five, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another, not to a pastor, not to a preacher, not to a prophetess, not to your bishop, to your core. To somebody who's walking with you with the same level of weakness, but believes in a God who is infinitely strong. It's a person of faith. I dare say crazy faith. Not that has it all together, but knows who holds it all together. It says, confess to them. Be vulnerable with them. Pray for each other and watch the result so that you may be, everybody say it, healed. You want to be healed here? In this place of pressure, you need to start valuing being vulnerable with community that you've selected because this is what Jesus had to do because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The old school saints would have said it like this. The prayers of the righteous availeth much. I don't know about that TH on the end of it, but it does something to me. The prayers of the righteous, they availeth, they work, they make a difference. Another criteria you need for the people in your life is, can you pray for me? Uh Uh-oh. Hold on, let me come to the garden for a second. Because the thing that I don't want you to do is to complain with me, to, 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 to wild out with me, to, 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 uh, to protect me in situations I'm even wrong in. Y'all know them friends that they don't even got to know what's going on. They ready to knock if you buck. Knock if you buck. They ready to go at any moment. But my new criteria because of the garden that I'm in is can you pray for me? And there are too many people in the garden of Gethsemane or the place of pressure that have opinions and no prayer. Everybody can make a post about it, but they have no fervent prayers and prayers have to be offered by people and people have to be connected to God's presence. And when you find the right people connected to God's presence, they will help you endure in the place of pressure. And there's so many of us that are in this spot right here. So Jesus tells us, if you're in a garden of Gethsemane, select your partners. But then if we continue with this prayer piece, the second thing you need to do is sow prayers. He asked for people who could watch and pray with him, but it wasn't so they could do it for him. So many of us are dependent on people in our lives that seem more godly or further along in the place of faith. But it does not abdicate you from making your own request known to God. When you are in a place of pressure, you have to pray. And prayer is talking and communicating with God. Look at it. Matthew 26, 38. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further... He fell on his face and he did what? Prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, see, we we, we jump to the nevertheless so fast, but we don't know how long he prayed that little prayer. He could have been saying that over and over because I know I've said that over. God, I know I said, let your will be done. But I was being dumb. This hurts. This sucks. This is uncomfortable. And if you could figure out a different way for me to reach purpose than them leaving, if you could figure out a different way, then you having me and my wife to have to go through this issue of infidelity, if you could figure out any other way, I'm ready for it. And I want us to sit there for a second because the truth of the matter is some of us were born into families 
that left us uncovered. And because we were sexually abused, all the things we did in our teenage years were a reaction to a violation. It's not even who we want to be. And now I got to deal with all of this stuff. What is there any other way? Some of us were put into situations we had no idea that they were stealing from the company. We now had no idea that they were, they were maneuvering and conniving their way using our name. We had no idea our parents opened up credit cards in our name. Oh, I'm talking about real stuff. I had no idea that I couldn't communicate how I really feel. So I run when somebody actually loves me. Is there any other way? Is there any other way that me being exposed on a national platform to make sure I'm still humble? Oh, y'all thought I was talking about you? I'm talking about me. I'm talking about God allowing me to go into a place of pressure that the only thing that would get me through this place of pressure is prayer with the right community. And literally, it's okay to express pain to God in the place of pressure. I want to give you permission because everybody says just pray and it should be gone. No. There are some things that progressively get better and progressively change. And when I come to this place of prayer, I want to pray my pain until it changes my perspective. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to give you a formula. You need to pray your pain until it, his presence, that communication changes your perspective. At some point, if you stay persistent, uh-huh, say that word with me, persistence. If you stay persistent in prayer, it'll change your perspective to the nevertheless. And so many people want you to just jump to nevertheless. And I can't just jump to nevertheless because it actually sucks here. I'm actually hurting here. But God says, pray the pain. Pray the disappointment. Pray the problem. P -p -p but stay here. See, this is what most of us would have done. We would have prayed it and not seen an answer and left the garden. <laughs> the Bible tells us that three times Jesus is in a place of prayer and he literally has to go from this place of prayer. And some in him says, go check on your boys. See if they're watching and praying with you. And he said, hold on. Hey, God, I hate this. God, I hate this. God, I hate this. But then he goes and then he sees his boys and they doing what? What happens when your prayer partners are pathetic? <laughs> I'm just trying to be real with you that sometimes the people that we do select as our core, they're not God. So they may fall asleep in places where you needed them to be up. He says, could y'all not watch with me for one hour? Y'all couldn't. Uh... But this is the point where most of us get so frustrated at our search situation and circumstance that we leave the garden. I'm in pain, I'm frustrated, and my partner's asleep. Forget it. I'm out of here. But watch what Jesus does. He goes back, verse 40, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said, Peter, you couldn't watch with me for one hour, bro? That's less than a documentary. Watch and pray. But watch this. It wasn't just for Jesus that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but my flesh is weak. The reason I'm trying to be this authentic with this message is because if we, if we take off all the makeup, if we take off all the clothes, if we take off all of the likes and the Instagram and the, all the stuff, the truth of the matter is we want to do the right thing. But our flesh is weak. And so what did God do in the form of Jesus? For a second time, it said he went and he prayed. My father, if this cannot pass, 
unless I drink this bitter cup, nevertheless, your will be done. And he took a break and went to see his friends again. And then babies was nap napping. (laughs) And I, I thought about this of how much Jesus had to stay focused on his purpose to stay through all of this pain. Jesus was something that we have to be in our garden, persistent. Write it down in the point. Persistence in prayer keeps you in place. It's not some deep prayer that sounds amazing. God, thou father, who is now the one that holds the stars. God, I'm mad. Matter of fact, I'm pissed off. And you said that you would never leave me or forsake me. But right now I'm feeling real alone. Like, can I say something to you? He can handle your hurt. I started to tell you a little bit, but I'm going to go more in depth right now. Earlier this year, probably about eight to 10 weeks ago, I was in the first message of me preaching this year. And I did an example where um, I used some saliva to paint a picture of what happened in the Bible. And um, before we got out of service, um, the spit had hit the fan. Every news media outlet, every, everything, social media, basically used this one moment that was misunderstood to try to sum up a life worth of service. And immediately I went from everything looking like this, everything being bright, everything being ready and blooming and winning and all all that DJ Khaled playing in the background. All we do is win, 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 no matter what. To in a moment, it went dark. Yeah. And in the moment that my life started to look like this, people didn't want to be associated. In the moment I got to the garden, people started unfollowing and distancing themselves and telling me that maybe God's purpose for my life, I just want to be real with y'all, may have been premature and that's why these young preachers and I mean, not just people who don't know God. I'm talking about people who, (laughs) I'm talking about people who, who claimed to love him. And I found myself in the middle of a garden that was full of pressure. And when I was sitting here, I was in a hotel right up the street with my wife. And I'm getting all these text messages and calls. And I'm like, what is going on? And God said, I'm about to put you in the press because I need new oil. Is there any other way? Nope. You asked to be used by me. So the only way to get the oil out is turn the pressure on. I'm going to say that one more time. The only way to get the oil out is turn the pressure on. And God said, you know what to do. I gave you the example. Get your people. Get your core. And me and some of the people in my core, we got on a plane and we flew to California and went to a hotel where none of us never been at and was looking at scenery. And every morning on the balcony of that hotel, after deleting Instagram and TikTok and Facebook, after making an apology, after doing all of these different things that was like, why am I even having to do this? And God says, because I got you in the press. It's crazy. My name was going crazy in the press. But God had me in the press. He literally named it. Yeah, the press is going to go crazy over this. Because I have to get oil out of you. And sitting on that balcony every morning, 
with the people in my core. I cried, is there any other way? Could you please just make it act like it didn't happen? I woke up one night and, 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 and I was like, I must be dreaming. And I realized it wasn't a dream. It was part of my destiny. But I had to stay here long enough. And literally as I began to pray, as I begin to build up my spirit in the place of pressing in the garden of Gethsemane, God said, this is the thing that's going to keep you in place. And I contemplated not preaching the next Sunday. I contemplated leaving the garden. I contemplated walking away from my spot. I contemplated, can I be real in this place right now? I contemplated not even confronting the issue. And God said, no, the press is creating fresh oil. So that next Sunday, I got up out of the thing that was trying to keep me down. And I said, I will not let what has happened to me in the press keep me from the platform that God has called me. And I'm not talking about a stage. I'm talking about some of y'all, the platform God gave you is in that kitchen raising those kids. Some of y'all, the platform that God has given you is in that schoolhouse. Some of y'all, the platform is in the boardroom and some of y'all, the platform is in that college. God said, do not abdicate your platform because you feel pressure. And as I went and I prayed, I got the, I got the unction to stand up. And this is the third thing that you have to do when you're in the garden. This was the hardest thing for me to do. I had to surrender power. See, it's not enough to select the right people when you're in a place of pressing. And it's not enough to just pray. You have to surrender power. That's what Jesus did. And going a little further, he said, nevertheless, not my will. That means he could have done something. <sighs> this whole time, you can do something. Is it the right thing? Probably not because it's your will. But God wants his will to supersede your will. But that means you have to surrender. Everybody say it. Power. And you got power even though you act powerless. This mouth is power. Them fingers are power. Your stubbornness is power. Uh-oh. Your pride is power. And God says, could I have it? Could I have your plan? Because that plan is power. That plan that you've wanted since you were in ninth grade, it's keeping you from my purpose. Could you surrender power? Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. Y'all, I got a revelation from this that I want to share with you that will change your life forever. At the pinnacle of Jesus's purpose in this garden, it was not defined by his strength. It was defined by his surrender. The strongest thing God ever did was surrender. The most powerful display of his power was not in what he could lift. It was in what he could let go. And I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but the pinnacle of your purpose is defined by your surrender, not your strength. You could talk yourself out of this situation, but God said, shut up. Surrender to what I'm trying to do in you. You could make excuses of why you are the way that you are. And it was my family. And then it was that case. And then it was them not giving me a chance. And God said, right now, you could be strong. But I need you to surrender. Because in your weakness, then that's when I get to step in and actually be your strength. And if I'm honest, it's hard to surrender. Oh, am I... Am I by myself right now? Y'all, when I was going through that thing, do you know how many, um, woo, <laughs> how many rebuttals and, 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 uh, like, woo, I, I'm good with my words. <laughs> I get paid to talk. <laughs> uh, 
I had so many things that God said, you'll never say it. They'll never know it. You'll never even talk about it. Because for you to make it through this place of pressure, you're going to have to surrender your power. There's a mother that has been using your kids as power over your husband. Surrender your power. There's a husband that's been using money and trips and things as a replacement for your presence. And God's saying to you today, surrender your power. There's somebody that has been using their creative genius to make other people feel small for an insecurity that you actually have on the inside of you. That's why you never ask for anybody else's opinion. And God says today, you need a team to do this. Surrender your power. Some of you have been following the plan for your life in this garden that's dark. And God is saying today, will you do like Jesus and surrender your power? Surrender. Is strength. And what I've found is many times the place you find so hard is the place that God calls holy. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. His partners can't stay with him. God has gone silent on him. And he decides to stay. Everybody say here. Because somewhere on the inside of him, he knew here was holy. Like if I can just make it through this place of pressure, this is going to change purpose forever. We never hear about anything else Jesus does, saving our sins and doing all of those things. If he does not last in the place of pressure, can I say that the history you're going to make is actually being made here. The place that's so uncomfortable. Oh, I feel the presence of God right now. As I'm watching this and I'm saying this and you're watching this, I feel God saying, don't call the place that's so hard the place you hate. Change it and call it holy. It's going to be from this place of pain. It's going to be from this place of despair. It's going to be from this place that I'm going to get glory from your life. Jesus surrenders his power and he stays in the garden. And as he's in the garden, he allows God to use all of his pain, all of his frustration, all of the lack and the loss to get purpose. What are you trying to say to me in this message, Pastor Mike? Don't give up in the garden. Because this is where most of us are, Bishop. We're in a place that it feels like nobody else is in this place. I'm here all alone. And I did not see it going like this. And I came to encourage you with good news. Don't give up in the garden. When Jesus didn't give up in the garden, Judas then came to betray him. When Jesus didn't give up in the garden, the Sadducees and the Pharisees persecuted him. When Jesus didn't give up in the garden, he took 39 lashes for me and you. When Jesus didn't give up in the garden, he carried his Christ, carried his cross. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgression. And he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace. He was trying to get us back to the place of peace that we lost in the OG or the original garden and he had to pay for it. It was upon him and with his stripes, we are healed. The only reason we can say scriptures like that is because he endured the place of pressure. He did not give up in the garden. And I don't know who you are and where you are and what's been pressing you, but I'm begging you, don't give up in the garden. Don't give up because it's hard. Don't give up because you can't see the future. Don't give up because it hurts. Don't give up. Because it's felt like a hindrance. Don't give up in the garden. 
Jesus didn't give up in the garden because he saw you. Jesus didn't give up in the garden because he saw me addicted to pornography. He saw me being a liar and a manipulator. He saw that I would be in need of a savior. And because Jesus didn't give up in the garden, he hung on a cross for crimes he didn't commit. And because he didn't give up on the plan and the purpose of God in the garden, he died on a Friday. And we call it Good Friday, but it wasn't good for him. And on Saturday, there wasn't a sound. The earth stood still. But I have good news. Saturday was a setup. <laughs> oh, I feel this thing right now on my bones. Saturday was a setup in the darkest moment where there's nothing happening. When you hear nothing from heaven, when nobody's around, when it looks completely dead. Saturday is a setup. And the Bible tells us that on Saturday he was working for us. That he snatched from the devil the keys of death, hell, and the grave. That he was warring for us to get back to a place of relationship with him. That he said, I lost my children in one garden, but I promise you I'm not going to lose them again. So I'm going to do everything. I'm going to defeat, defeat depression. I'm going to fight anxiety. I'm going to come against suicide. I'm going to talk to every lie that the enemy would tell. And I'm going to defeat it. And early Sunday morning, I'm feeling churchy right now, but early Sunday morning when they went to the stone to see if he was still there, the stone was rolled away. And Jesus had risen with all power. The power in him surrendering gave him the power to save. Uh, the power in surrendering gives you the power to save somebody else. And Jesus surrendered his power in the garden so that he could gain power to save us. That's why we celebrate Easter. It's because he didn't give up in the garden. When Jesus didn't give up in the garden, it's because he knew Michael, Bree, Charles, Brenda, Scott, Tammy. He knew Paul. Come on, put your name in there. Say your name right now. He knew. Come on, say it one more time. He knew would need him. He surrendered so I could be saved. The Bible tells us he could have called legions of angels to save him. They didn't kill him. The Bible tells us he gave up. Oh, he gave up the ghost. He surrendered so that he would have the power to save. And that's why Hebrews 12, 2 said, because he saw me. He fixed his eyes. Or we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith for the joy. That's how God sees us. We're his joy for the joy. The fact that we could be in relationship with God, that we could go back to the original garden, that we could be in relationship with him, that we could be in his presence again for the joy that was set before him. That's why he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And then when he defeated death, hell, and the grave and rose again with all power, what did he do? He took a seat. I love this picture of Jesus. Not that he's up every day fighting a battle. No, 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 no. The battle's already won. <laughs> See, when you step into this relationship with Jesus, this is not an everyday fight. We got the end of the book. We win. He has already done everything that needs to be done. We just have to receive it. How do we know? Because he's seated. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of God because he accomplished purpose 
because he didn't give up in the garden. Let me give you my last point. I feel the presence of God. Jesus didn't give up in the garden. So you don't have to give up in the garden. In this fallen world where it looks like the garden is filled with weeds. Filled with all kinds of things that take away from the beauty of life. God said, I want to give you beauty for ashes. I want to take this burnt up situation. Oh, I feel the presence of God. The burnt pieces of your life. I want to take the places where you thought you could never come back from. And I want to allow you to bloom. I want you to grow. But the only way you can do that is by accepting what I did for you. Don't give up here in this garden because I've already made a way for you to have relationship with God. Today, I need everybody to begin to pray because mm. people's lives are in the balance right now. And I know you hate the garden you're in right now because the garden you're in right now is so hurtful and the garden you're in where there's abuse, it's been hard. And the garden that you're in where they don't see your value, it seems like you're a hindrance everywhere you go. And it seems like you're taking hits that you don't deserve. And it feels like you're hemorrhaging and you're bleeding out for people who don't even care about you. And it feels like you're handicapped. Here does not feel like what I think it should feel like because here I feel helpless and even worse, I feel hidden. But today God says, don't give up in the garden. I feel the presence of God coming into your home, coming into your life, and more than anything, coming into your heart right now. Don't give up in the garden, no matter how bad it is. Don't give up in that place, no matter how bad it hurts. Don't give up, even if others gave up. Don't give up in this garden. There's something on the other side of this for you. The reason why Jesus went to the cross is so that your past would not define your future. When Jesus looks at you, when you accept his son, he doesn't see you. He sees his son who endured the garden for you to be in relationship with God. And I got to say this because somebody is confused right now. Don't give up is what I just told you. Somebody say, don't give up. Say it like you mean it. Don't give up. Speak to your soul. Say, don't give up. Speak to your mind. Say, don't give up. I'm telling you, don't give up. But please do surrender. <laughs> See, some of y'all think I said the same thing. I'm telling you, don't give up. But I am telling you, surrender. Let me, let me break it down for you. Giving up comes from weariness. Surrender comes from willingness. Oh, that's nasty right there. Giving up comes because we can't take it no more. But surrender. So in the same garden, in the same place, with the same situation, in the same circumstances, and the same pain, it all comes down to perspective. I don't want to do this no more. Do I give up? Or do I surrender? I can't take raising these kids by myself. I'm a single mother and his baby and, and his baby. He acts like it ain't his and I'm trying to search for love and all this other stuff. Do I give up? Or do I surrender? There's no way I'm going to be able to get from under this financial strain. There's no way they're going to be able to help me pass this month. Do I give up? Or do I surrender? But these drug charges, I did that 10 years ago and I can't find a job and nobody will hire me. And I'm not that same man and I'm about to go back to the streets. Do I 
give up or do I surrender? I've been raised in church all my life, but I don't feel this God thing no more. I'm tired of watching pastors fall and people abuse sheep. And so I'm about to walk away from all of it. Hold on. Do you give up or do you surrender? Today, that's what I want to ask everybody. Don't give up in the garden. Surrender in the garden. Wherever you find yourself in life right now, surrender. And it's funny when I think about the international sign of surrender all across the world, whether you're in, in California or you're in Cairo, if you're in Dallas or if you're in the deserts in Egypt, if somebody comes to you who has authority and they say, freeze, put your hands up. What is the international sign of surrender? Hands going up. Come on, put it in the chat. Yeah. In the room right now, just put your hands up. God's saying this is the sign of surrender. Oh, I feel the presence of God right now. He said, if you surrender, ooh, if you would, if you would just not give up, but give in to my plan, I'll do something in your life that you could never, ever think was possible. Galatians 6, 9, this is for all the people who are about to give up because of weariness. He said, let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due time, due season, the right moment, you will reap a harvest if you do not. What does it say? Give up. Today I came, I'm sweating in this pink suit to let you know that in whatever garden you find yourself, no, how, no matter how dark it is, don't give up in the garden. Because if you don't give up in the garden and you invite God into the garden, then you get restored back to the original garden that he wanted us to have. Then we give back problems and get back provision. We give back being paranoid and we get back peace. Somebody's going to get happy right here. We give back perversion and we get purity. We give back panic and we get patience. We give back pettiness and we get perspective. When we give God our lives, we give back pride. And guess what we get again? Partnership. If you don't give up in the garden, you give the pain back to him. He literally tells us in his word, trade me. I'll take your sorrow. I'll take your shame. This is what I went. Trade me. And I'll take your pain and I'll give you back paradise. What God wants to do is take your garden. Listen, listen to this. He doesn't want to take you out of the garden. He wants to change the scene in the garden. He's not asking you to divorce your story. All of these roses, all of these flowers, even the thorns are part of your testimony. Everything I've been through is something that God will use. Where there has been pain, I can now pick that pain up and I can deliver it to somebody and it be a sign of purpose. The reason I'm sharing my testimony with you today is because these flowers have thorns on them that I used in my life. But now I'm giving you the manicured version, the purposeful version. If I literally show up to my wife with a bouquet of these, she looks at what caused me pain as a sign of me having pleasure in her. God can take your pain, submit it to him. He can turn it into something that's pleasurable for somebody else and give them perspective. Today, God's saying, don't give up in the garden because I want to take your pain and I want to make something beautiful. This, the scene is changing. I feel this for you. The scene, literally, 
When Jesus rose, it took what was dark and it started suddenly changing into something that literally highlighted. Oh, I feel this. This is a prophetic picture of what your life and your family is about to look like. Somebody better grab this by faith. He's going to take what looks dark. Oh, I feel this. He's going to take what used to would have taken you out a year ago. And he's going to turn it into something beautiful. In one garden, we were removed from his presence. And we'll, in another garden, we were redeemed back to relationship. Today, I want you to surrender. Could everybody just for me, just for one second, could you do the international sign of surrender again? Come on. At your house, no matter if somebody sent you the link to this, this is purpose right now. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Oh. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to surrender. Your will, your way, your ideas, your parents' ideas that now you live out. Surrender it. Surrender your plan. God, I surrender. There's a prayer I want us all to pray together, a prayer of surrender. Oh. Somebody just say, God, I just want to be right where you are. Striding at the beat of your heart. Come on, this is a prayer of surrender. I'm going to follow your will. No matter how far. Because everything I need. God, you are. It's easy to surrender when you know that God has everything you need. Today, as the worship team ministers this next song, I want you to ask, Holy Spirit, what are you trying to say to me through this message? And I believe that right now, this is not weird or spooky. This is not anything. This is just going to be a moment of silence and solitude as ministry goes forth in your home, in this room, wherever you are, that the Holy Spirit is going to start to whisper to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Surrender that. Surrender that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you always thought you were going to be like that, but get that to me too. And as you surrender, you're going to realize that everything you need, you're going to be able to say, God, you are. Let's worship God.
This is your moment. You heard the words of the song. And even as we begin to sing hallelujah at the end, that was a, a cry of victory because God has already won the victory, but now it's time for you to receive it. This entire day, this whole moment, this whole garden, I'm out here pollen everywhere, I'm sneezing because we made all of this just to give you an opportunity to see how good God is. Where because of sin, we were locked out of one garden and in another garden because Jesus endured. 
we now have an opportunity to be in relationship with God. But the Bible tells us with all of this available, it's all null and void if you don't receive it. It's like having a million dollars in a bank and somebody giving you a debit card and you not knowing the pin number. Struggling to get by with all of the resources at your fingertips. And God is saying, would you receive what I've already paid for? Your sin had a large bill, but Jesus paid it all. And today, all you have to do is receive. See, this decision to receive Jesus is the best decision I've ever made in my entire life. It took me from being a liar, a manipulator, somebody who was addicted to pornography, somebody who had a felony case for car insurance fraud. Yeah, I'm telling everything about me because I need you to know there is nothing you've done that makes you outside of the reach of God. I know religion has told you that now you need to clean this up. You need to change this. No, 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 no. This church and God's house is a hospital for humanity. If you were not sick, you wouldn't be here. This is the place where you get healed. This is the place where I got healed. But it didn't come in strength. It came in surrender. So today... Today is the day of salvation. What better day than on Easter to give your life to Christ and start a transformation in your life and not just for you, but for every person that will come after you. In just a moment, we're going to pray. But our church is beginning to pray right now all over the world. Y'all, there are literally people all over the world praying because right now, there are two kingdoms warring for your life. Uh, and this whole presentation to, was to let you know that one loses eternally, but the other has won all victory. And right now where the one, the liar, the accuser of the brother and the devil is trying to convince you, you can never change. You've tried this before. This is not going to work for you. He's trying to tell you, tell you to give up in the garden. I came to tell you that I have good news that God didn't give up on you in the garden. And today you can have everlasting life. If you want to be included in this prayer we're about to say, on the count of three, I just want you to lift your hand. No matter where you are, no matter what you did yesterday, no matter what you're planning to do tomorrow, and no matter where you're sitting or who you're sitting with right now, today is the day of salvation. One, you're making the greatest decision of your life. Two, I'm so proud of you. But forget all of that. God is going to write your name in the Lamb's book of life. Your eternity will be secure. Three, shoot your hand up all over this world if you want to accept Jesus. Oh, I feel the presence of God. Now listen, at Transformation Church, nobody prays alone. There are, there are thousands of people right now. See, I can't see all of your hands, but God is right there with you right now. The Holy Spirit stands outside of time. I'm talking, but He's speaking. Ah. And he's saying, thank you for not giving up in the garden. Today, the scene changes on your life. Everybody, I want us to pray all together because you know at Transformation Church, nobody's going to pray alone. We're going to pray all together for the benefit of those who are coming to Christ. Everybody just say with your whole heart, God, thank you for not giving up in the garden. Thank you for enduring the cross just for me. Today, I invite you into my life. Change me. Renew me. Transform me. I believe you lived, you died, and rose again with all power so that I could surrender. Here I am. Here I am. Just one more time. Somebody say, here I am. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give God? Oh, come on, Transformation Church. Come on, let's give God. All of heaven is turning up right now in this room. 
We are giving God the glory for every soul, for every person, for every family, for every destiny. For every one of God's children that just didn't give up in the garden. I'm telling you, you have just walked in to another level of living. That the gardener, the Bible calls God the gardener. He's now about to walk through the pieces and the places of your life. And he's going to start picking out the things that can't stay. And he's going to plant the things that are going to bring beauty. Welcome to a brand new garden. (laughs) Your heart is the soil that God is going to plant seeds. And we want to be a place that helps you grow. If you just gave your life to Christ, no matter who you are, where you're at, I want you to text SAVE to the number on the screen. And we're not going to hound you. We ain't going to show up at your house. We're not going to do none of that. We want to help you. We want to give you resources. We want you to be able to know what your next step is, to be able to allow God to make the garden of your life look so beautiful. You now have the master gardener in your life. And and I even feel this by the spirit. Some of you need to go back and go to YouTube and watch a series called Planted, Not Buried. Like even I'm thinking right now as a garden, some of y'all have felt under, undervalued, underutilized, undercover, but God wants to let you know that a planting and a burial seem the same. But it depends what seed went in to see what's going to come out. I feel that some of y'all are about to start blooming, that there are things that God is going to place on the inside of you that are about to bring life. Somebody shout at me, life! We want to walk with you. Next week, There's going to be a powerful message in the house. And then the week after that, we're starting a new sermon series that I feel real passionate about called cuffing. Y'all know how people talk about cuffing season and relationships and all that? Yeah, 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 yeah. God's given me a revelation about what you're cuffed to. And I want to help you if you're starting in a new garden to unlock some of the things you're cuffed to and to cuff to the right things. For the next six weeks, I'm asking you to do something differently than you've ever done. I want you to put God, everybody say first. I want you to make coming to church, getting with believers, getting your, just make it a priority for six weeks. And I promise you, you're going to see your entire life begin to change or how I like to say transform. I'm so grateful for this moment that we have today because I know that where we started is different than where we are right now. And I'm so grateful to God. Whoa. For seeing fit to use somebody like me. To tell people the good news that we have in the garden. That Jesus has risen. Today, thank you, Father, for everything you've done. Thank you for the lives that have been changed. And thank you for changing my life. Thank you for going to the cross. Thank you, Father God, for staying seeing me and my sin and seeing my brothers and sisters. And conquering death, hell, and the grave and rising again with all power. Today, everything has changed. We honor you. We bless you. And for the thousands of people who just gave their life to you, I thank you that their life will never be the same. God, I'm thanking you for radical transformation. 
God, I'm thanking you for the things that they desired, Father, just a few moments ago. You'll take the taste out of their mouth, Father. You're surrounding them with a core and a community that will transform their lives. And God, thank you for the thousands of people who have given, prayed, invited, and who will invite people to this experience. Thank you for their willingness to use their testimony to be beauty in somebody else's story. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. Thank you, God, for not giving up in the garden. In Jesus' name, somebody say, we agree. We expect. Amen. Hey, listen to me. This message in 30 minutes is going to be available on YouTube. I need everybody that is watching right now to go ahead and make a decision who you are going to invite, tell, and send this to so that they can find life and light no matter how dark their garden is. Okay, okay. every day this week, I, I can't tell you how many testimonies I have of people walking up and say, my uncle would just always send me this link and I would just literally close my app. And then one day, ooh, somebody say one day. See, when people are desperate, God will always have a moment of destiny. I want you to use your influence this week and I want you to send this message to as many people as you can to let them know, don't give up in the garden. I thank you so much for this time that you've been with us. Next week is going to be crazy. But until then, go out and live a transformed life. Can we give God some praise? Oh, I said, let's give God some praise. I love you. Come My on. Goodness. That message, Woo! so, so powerful. The demonstration and people gave yes. their life to Christ Come right on. now in the chat. I want you to give people a high five yes. because this is our why. This is the it vision. Is. Representing God to the lost yes. and found for transformation in Christ and such an amazing message with practical tools, Will, that people can use. It's so true. Um, listen, if you made that decision, I'm telling you right now, as somebody that has seen the strength in surrender and given up my yes. life, PJ, I know your life has been transformed yeah. when you surrendered it to the Lord. Can I just tell you, you just made the best Come decision on. of your life. Whether you're saying yes for the first time or maybe you're rededicating your life to the Lord, I'm telling you, things are about yes. to change. And you need to do us a favor though. We want you to text SAVED to 828282. And the reason is we have a culture of relationship, okay? You're not in this alone. We say it, we belong together. We wanna give you resources, yes. next steps so we can walk this with you. But before we do anything, can we just take a moment and pray all around the world? Can we, let's just link our faith and pray over the people yes. that just made that decision. Father God, thank you. Lord, thank you first and foremost for loving us enough to seeing us, to caring about us, to sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for us. We, we just the, the chance that we would say yes, God. It wasn't even a guarantee, God. Thank you that you cared about us enough to give us the option, to give us the chance to receive the free yes, gift, Lord. Lord. Thank you that there is strength and surrender. Thank you for the people that just surrendered their lives for the very first time, God, but for the people that just rededicated their lives to made that, made that decision to re-surrender, God. Thank you for the transformation that is gonna take place. That already is taking place, God. We know life doesn't just all of a sudden magically get perfect, Lord, yes. but we don't have to do it alone. We don't have to give up in the garden because you didn't give up in the garden. You didn't give up on us. God, thank you for the people on the other side of this camera, Father, the people in their apartments, their cars, their houses. Father, sitting outside watching this in the gym. God, thank you that you see us. Thank you that you love us. God, thank you for not giving up on us. We surrender all the people. We put lay every single person down at the foot of the cross and say, have your way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We remain expectant. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 My God. goodness. God Listen, is moving. I, I, 
Here's the thing, Will, is that there are so many people who still need to experience this. And so I want to encourage you. I know the day is starting to wind down and all of that, but I want to encourage you. Maybe you take a moment and you invite a coworker or a friend or a family member. You invite them into your space to join you to experience God and what he did for you today. You are a billboard for him. Come on. That's it. I, I, I love what he yep. said there. There, You know somebody that is ready to give up in their garden reach out to them tell them come be a part of this listen there's something else that's happening listen tell them what um, is it V2 Conference Come on, V2. is coming oh, this fall yes goodness. you heard me say it if you experience V1 you just then you already know and if you didn't then you got a glimpse Listen, so join us V2 out. here's the thing it's happening in the fall make sure you follow yes. us on our socials check your email oh. all the good stuff we're going to give you all the details in the come days on. to Listen, come don't play yourself okay <laughs> version 1 was crazy I can't even imagine some of them are texting somebody right now girl they, we gotta right, get there see, come on they're already looking it up right now <laughs> come on put some fire in the chats right come now on. if you were excited for V2 it's gonna be crazy I'm ready for it Man, well listen that's about all we have That's for it. today. We're so excited that you've joined yeah. us. We encourage you, go back, watch this again, yes. share it, text it to somebody. Go out and live a transformed, a transformed life. life. Love you guys. <laughs>